proceedings are graciously hosted uh, by First Presbyterian Church, but the organizing groups were a small Sunday night worship that meets here called Come Together and the United Church of Cookville. And I see people also from the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Cookville and uh, the Methodist Church and several other communities here in town. But this is really a, uh, a culmination of something that we have been uh, working on and dreaming about for many, many years. And so I'm really grateful to see all of you uh, here this evening. Uh, when I got to Cookville, it was 2001, and I still lived in Liberty, Tennessee, but I took a job at Tennessee Tech. And just a few weeks after I started my new job at Tennessee Tech, I was driving from uh, Liberty over the lake, over Center Hill Lake, on a beautiful autumn morning as the sun was coming up. And I turned on National Public Radio, as I usually do during those days, driving from Liberty to Cookville. And I heard about the planes and the bombs and the destruction, I should say the planes that were used as bombs, and the destruction in New York City. And I was afraid. I was very afraid of war. And I know a lot of you now are here for a long time tonight, but the first person I met in Cookville that's here tonight was Sayo tonight, because he organized a peace rally in Cookville, and we had about five people, maybe <laughs> ten. It was Hector Black, and Sayo tonight and me, and a few others, and we walked from, from Tennessee Tech down here to the square for peace yeah. way back in 2001. And, it's, and uh, we're still marching. Uh, this year, um, I've been really getting in touch with my lineage because my father passed. And my father was a civil rights activist. And he, he's going to appear in this story. But I've met a new family uh, who live in Atlanta, Georgia. And their names are Calvin and Nelia. And they were here at Tennessee Tech in the 60s. And uh, they told me a story that I found very upsetting about what happened at Tech when Dr. King was assassinated. <laughs> And then I went and got with our Tennessee Tech archivist, uh, Mansell Johnson, in the ground floor of the library. And I, uh, and I researched what the uh, students were saying about this uh, when it happened. So I've got this little story, and it's actually part of my research paper. And I'm, I'm defending my, my Master of Theology thesis on Tuesday in Nashville at Vanderbilt Divinity School. But you all are going to be the first to, outside of uh, my close, uh, close associates and my wife and friends, to hear the story of... Uh, of 68 through the lens of uh, some Tennessee Tech students and also through the lens of my parents. By the time of the Poor People's Campaign and the Memphis Sanitation Workers' Strike, Martin Luther King's lack of popularity among some Southern whites was no secret. Moreover, his unwavering commitment to nonviolence, and as Liz reminded us today, non-silence, had lost him support among more militant blacks. National television coverage on the CBS included full-color clips from King's epic mountaintop speech and these remarks from President Johnson. America is shocked and saddened by the brutal slaying tonight of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I ask every citizen to reject the blind violence that has struck Dr. King, who lived in nonviolence. I almost forgot now. I've got my parents uh, gave me their uh, vinyl record of Dr. King. And I'm going to go ahead right now, and I'm going to play for you uh, that, just that short clip, which I'm sure you all have heard before because it's been played many times on, uh, on television. Um, and uh, this is one of the few times that I've got to all my personalities of, of preacher, teacher, and DJ have all gotten to come out <laughs> all at the same time. So uh, let me see. Uh, yes, this is only a 25-second clip. And on this album, it's called Excerpt from the Speech the day before his death. Well, I don't know what... But I got into mental. And some began to say the threat. I talk about the threat that were out. Uh, what would happen to me from some of our six white brothers. Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now. Because I've been to the mountaintop. And I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life, long everything has its place.
So my friends were uh, Calvin and Nelia, and Calvin and Nelia remember learning the news and heading to the TV room in their campus dormitory. The response from their peers was disheartening, to say the least. All these people were just happy, Calvin recalls. Then Nelia succinctly summarized what she remembers hearing. He got what he deserved. That's what he gets being uppity. The poem Nelia recalls writing after the tragedy dismisses her colleague's cruelty. She was essentially, quote, branding my friends as having bubblegum minds. Among the majority white students on a campus with a very small minority population just a few years after integrating for the first time, the scary consensus celebrated Dr. King's demise. Coverage in the Oracle newspaper confirmed the mood of divisiveness that King's legacy created among whites in Cookville. Uh, apparently no one from faculty to students to the community, could elude the controversies coming to the surface after the leader's martyrdom. History professor B.F. Jones was the target of a backlash as he and his colleagues <coughs> attempted to create a scholarship fund bearing the name of the slain preacher and teacher. In response to the scholarship idea, anonymous hate mail disturbed professors like Will Schrader and Jones. Other tech faculty joined the chorus of negativity. The oracle quotes Schrader saying, I am disturbed that people like this don't have the backbone to sign their names. Mm. Jones added, I expected some letters like these, but I didn't expect any from faculty members. Mm. Other than Bob Lewis, B.F. Jones was the Cookville mentor most influential in changing the lives of Calvin and Nelia. They had switched majors to history and stayed on campus two years to complete the master degree, writing about African American struggles in their graduate work. Jones's emphasis on black studies helped to rash, radicalize these idealistic white activists. Nelia says that as much as Jones respected King, he had been disappointed with King's opposition to the war. But even the commander of the war and nemesis to the anti-war movement, Lyndon Johnson, could not mute his grief at losing Martin Luther King. President Johnson ordered American flags hung at half-mast in response to the murder in Memphis. The campus response in Cookville is disturbing. The Oracle reported, quote, the stars and stripes have not flown above the tech campus since Tuesday after the, the rope used to raise the United States flag was cut for the second time. So apparently, and now this is me speaking, white racism ran so deep in the Tennessee culture that vandals would sooner deface the American flag than afford any deference to one of the most articulate dissenters the country has ever known. Retired Cookville journalist Mary Jo Denton was Mary Jo Johnson in 1968. Hopefully you, you Cookvillans remember her from the Herald Citizen. And she, she was teaching freshman English at Tech as a teaching assistant. She remembers all the key players in the Wesley Foundation quite well. She explains, I had earned my BA degree at Berea College in Kentucky, a school founded by abolitionists and devoted to racial equality. So even though I had grown up here in the Upper Cumberland, my undergraduate years at Berea had broadened my views considerably. Then I entered grad school at TTU and was shocked at the racist attitudes here at the time. Back in April 1968, her letter to the editor expressed sentiments similar to those Calvin and Nelia were feeling. In her brief remarks, Denton regretted, quote, the air of celebration apparent in portions of the student body at Tech upon news of the death of Dr. King. The same mood that Kimbrough saw in the TV dorm room, or the dorm's TV room, Denton experienced in the classroom. She, she writes, I have never been more discouraged concerning my task than when my class of 25 people almost unanimously expressed hatred and racism in a discussion of the events of the past four days, unquote. Even though Denton has spent her life here, her younger self questioned the wisdom of working with tech students. Her exasperation was surely shared by other Cookville people of conscience as she pleaded, quote, how can one teach the meaning and value inherent in the concept of literature or any other art to people who lack elementary humanity, end quote. And that was 1968, and I was just a baby living with my parents in Chicago. My dad, Kenneth Smith, was mobilized by the Illinois National Guard to patrol the streets of Chicago while the city burned. In his 10 years of service, this was the closest my father would ever come to a combat situation. But Barb reminded me that his unit did not have live ammunition during their duties then. 
And in, in my writing of this, I wondered why the same wisdom wasn't practiced two years later at Kent State. Um, in the larger manuscript, um, there's a whole story about how Kent, the students at Tech reacted to the murders at Kent State, and they were much more sympathetic to the white students at Kent who, in 1970 who were murdered by the National Guard than they were to, to King's assassination. Later that summer, so close to our home now, this is in Chicago, the police would riot against protesters during the turbulence surrounding the Democratic National Convention. My mother's lifelong career as a political activist and justice advocate was in part motivated by the horror she saw that summer. The church where I had been baptized in February of 68 became a focal point for clergy activism. In his book, Sunday Morning, Aspects of Urban Ritual, Michael Ducey details that night that the preachers tried to take action in the park. Anticipating the confrontations to come on the evening of August 27th, ministers and lay people gathered at the Church of the Three Crosses. Ducey reports how they, quote, decided to go as a body into the park and to try to mediate the conflict and to, quote, take with them to the park the huge cross, which at that time was located in the sanctuary of the church, unquote. This decision was affirmed by the clergy quite spontaneously, even though the cross came from an earlier building from one half of the hybrid congregation and was, quote, the symbol of that congregation's existence. Ducey explains what happened later that night when the police effectively ended the demonstration with a threat of force. Quote, in the melee which followed, the cross fell to the ground and the ministers were dispersed among with the demonstrators. And when they went back to the park early the next morning to retrieve the cross, it was nowhere to be found. Like the lyrics by Fred Kahn invoking a Christ on the road and in riots and even in prison in systems, the Christ that came to Chicago was both protester and police officer. The cross that the protesting preachers carried into the park showed a church willing to lose its symbols to find its soul. If Christ is still crucified, then Christ died with Martin Luther King and the students of Kent State. Like my parents, Calvin and Neelia Kimbrough were changed by the tragedies of the 60s and their relationship with God deepened by meeting Jesus and in this irony and in the insanity of human suffering. So today, as a member of the Tennessee Tech community and as a, as a faculty of Tennessee Tech, I repent and I apologize for the people of my campus that cheered the day that Martin Luther King was died. I'm sorry. <laughs> At this time, I would like to say some names of some martyrs. And I'd like that time to be followed by some silence. And I'd also like to remember some saints as well as some martyrs. And so during that silence, um, before uh, Selena and Sayota come and bring us a very special song in keeping with the spirit, um, you are free to say out loud the name of any saint or martyr that you wish to remember, local saints and saints in your family as well as, as our community and public saints. And uh, after the time of, of saying the names of, uh, of our saints and martyrs, uh, we'll have silence and then we'll have a song. Ken Smith, Martin Luther King Jr., Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Oscar Romero, Jimmy Lee Jackson, Viola Liuzzo, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, Four Little Girls, Rosa Parks, Bantu Steve Abiko, Matthew Evers, Hector Black. Kennedy. Cesar Chavez. Emmett Till. 